Say what you will about our current Astros, but this video isn't about this dynasty, the modern team that has made six straight ALCSs and won two World Series along the way. They're now known as a titan of MLB these days, but just a couple decades ago, the Houston Astros of the 1990s were a forgettable set of teams, known for their playoff implosions and, uh, interesting uniforms. You remember Craig Biggio and Jeff Bagwell, but the team itself didn't succeed much in this era, except for one year, in 1998, where they eclipsed 100 wins for the first time in franchise history. They've done that four times since 2017 now, but back then, this was a huge deal. Their rise to elite status came off the back of both a solid roster and one big move. The move is what I consider maybe the best win now trade of any MLB trade deadline ever. The thing is, nobody really remembers it. Let's figure out why. The 1998 Astros were coming off their first playoff berth and division victory in over a decade, despite a season where they only won 84 games. That's the NL Central for you. They were promptly swept out of the 1997 NLDS by the annual monster that was the Atlanta Braves. To this point, the Astros had made the playoffs just four times in a little over 30 years, and had yet to win a playoff series ever. Knowing the Titan that they are now, it's hard to believe their lineage, but this is how things were. Come July 31st of that season, the Astros were 21 games over 500 with a three and a half game lead in the NL Central. Though they likely could have coasted to another division title with their already impressive roster, the front office wanted to push the envelope to try and overcome their first round curse. Despite having the second best team ERA in baseball behind the Braves, the Astros found a perfect opportunity to bolster their pitching staff with a blockbuster transaction. Over in the Pacific Northwest, a disgruntled Randy Johnson was enduring arguably the worst season of his young career in a contract year. Johnson never wanted this to be a contract year though, expecting to receive a hefty extension offer from the Seattle Mariners, a team which he had poured his blood, sweat, and tears into for the previous decade. Let's really give this context for a second. For Seattle, Johnson tossed over 200 innings in six separate seasons. He made four all-star teams, led the American League in strikeouts four seasons in a row, placed top three in Cy Young voting three times, and won the award itself in 1995. That was the same year where the Mariners saved their franchise by making the playoffs in upsetting the Yankees in the ALDS, and Johnson was a massive piece of that puzzle. He tossed in a 125-pitch complete game in a regular season tiebreaker against the California Angels to get Seattle into the dance in the first place before taking the mound once again in Game 3 of the ALDS. With the Mariners a game away from elimination, down 2-0, Johnson threw 7 innings and 117 more pitches to secure a vital victory. After winning a pivotal Game 4 to send the series to a winner-take-all final game, Seattle deployed Johnson in relief on just one day's rest to try and save their season in extra innings. He threw three more innings, basically pitching until his arm gave out, but it was worth it. The Mariners upset the Yankees and headed to their first ALCS in team history, where Johnson pitched two more starts. In total that season, Johnson threw nearly 250 innings en route to his first American League Cy Young. For most pitchers, this amount of usage would be damning and downright irresponsible, but for Johnson, it was just another day at the office. I give you this anecdote from 1995 to give context to the ugly situation of 1998. Despite fighting through injuries and giving his team everything he had, the Mariners didn't offer Johnson an extension. And though they initially didn't want to trade him either, an 8-20 record in the month of June that season sunk their chances of contending. So they were stuck, and Johnson then became the star piece of that year's trade deadline. That takes us back to now, July 31st, with the Astros having one of the best pitching staffs in baseball in addition to their potent lineup featuring Jeff Bagwell, Craig Biggio, Derek Bell, and and Moises Alou, the front office saw the opportunity with an incensed Randy Johnson looking to pitch for a top contender. And so, they swooped in to try and make their move, and with a package of Carlos Guillen and Freddy Garcia, the Mariners deemed them the right partner for the transaction. Randy Johnson was a Houston Astro. The trade would pay dividends in the future for Seattle, but at the present moment, the baseball world was in awe. Randy Johnson, one of the most dominant pitchers in baseball for the past five or so years, had just been traded to a team that was already dominant to begin with. Teammates understood the magnitude of this trade, with Craig Biggio noting how there are a lot of guys in this league who haven't seen him and a lot of guys who are going to wish they hadn't. Johnson immediately made his presence known with a dominant 12 strikeout performance in his first start, overwhelming the lowly Pittsburgh Pirates who would go on to lose 93 games that season. As if that wasn't enough, Johnson would throw back-to-back -back complete game shutouts in his subsequent two starts against the Phillies and the Brewers. For those wanting to keep count, that was 25 innings, two earned runs, 33 punchouts, and three W's in just three starts for Randy Johnson. 
Johnson. The National League simply wasn't ready or prepared to face a beast like Randy Johnson, a guy who had dominated the American League for the past decade. The Phillies did get a second look at Johnson after a shutout against the Brewers, however, and they were able to score three runs off him, enough to hand him a loss. This would happen to be the only loss Randy Johnson would suffer in 11 starts in total with the 1998 Astros. Something must have snapped within Johnson here because he'd go on to win all of his seven remaining starts in a row following this rough outing. Johnson kicked off another amazing three-start stretch. He'd throw a pair of complete game shutouts once again, first against the Pirates where he struck out 16 batters, and then another against the Reds where he struck out 14 batters. In his three starts against the Pirates, Braves, and Reds from the end of August through September, Johnson allowed one earned run in 26 innings and struck out 40 batters. This guy was an absolute monster. Overall, Johnson tossed 11 fantastic starts for the Astros, racking up 10 wins in just two months of play in the NL Central. He never threw less than 100 pitches in any of these starts, struck out 10 or more batters in seven of them, and threw four complete game shutouts along the way. This was in a two-month span. This was a rare, unprecedented run of dominance from one of the greatest pitchers to ever toe the slab, and it's insane that not many people remember it two decades later. The Astros got an astounding 4.3 wins above replacement from Johnson in only about two months. He finished seventh in NL Cy Young voting that year, despite only being in the NL for less than half the season. We'll talk more later about the value the Mariners got in return for dealing their ace, but the Astros had a playoff run to worry about first. Before going into the NLDS against the Padres, some noted the lack of run support given to Johnson during his starts with Houston, despite their renowned hitters. The Astros averaged a little over four runs per game in Johnson's starts. Not horrible, but they did fail to score over four runs in over half the starts as well. This unfortunately became a prevalent theme for the playoff run as well. Randy Johnson dueled Kevin Brown in game one against the Padres, and to Brown's credit, I'm of the opinion that he probably should have won NL Cy Young this season over Tom Glavin. Johnson was dominant in his start, allowing just two runs in eight innings, one coming off a Greg Vaughn solo shot. But Kevin Brown was unbelievable, striking out 16 batters in eight shutout innings with only four base runners allowed. Better yet, he passed the ball to Trevor Hoffman for the ninth, who finished second in Cy Young voting that year, and he locked down the two to one save and game one victory. That was one Randy Johnson start down the drain. The Padres led for most of game two, but Billy Wagner would blow the save. Fortunately, the Astros walked off to tie the series. The lineup, however, was once again stymied by Kevin Brown in game three, wasting six innings of one run ball from Mike Hampton, who had a great season himself. They sent Randy Johnson back to the mound for game four to try and save their season, a position Johnson had been in before. He kept them in the game with six innings of one run ball, but the offense once again stalled out. Sterling Hitchcock went on to strike out 11 Astros and beat Randy Johnson to secure an NLDS victory for the Padres. Some guy named Sterling Hitchcock. No, I didn't make this up. This is the dude that sent one of the best Astros teams ever home packing. Sterling Hitchcock. He did have a solid career, for sure, but this is the guy that beat maybe the best version of Randy Johnson ever. Sterling Hitchcock. He sounds like a mystery author, and he beat Randy Johnson in a playoff game. Okay. All in all, Johnson tossed 14 innings with just three earned runs allowed, struck out 17 batters, and walked just two, and still somehow managed to lose both of his playoff starts. The Astros managed just two runs of support total in his two starts combined, and wasted possibly the greatest pitching talent to ever put on an Astros uniform. So, what happened next? Well, after two months of perhaps the greatest pitching of his entire career, a 35-year-old Randy Johnson was set to hit free agency. Now I know, signing a 35-year-old can be a risky deal, but the Astros inexplicably weren't major players in the bidding war that ensued, and Johnson ended up signing with a second-year expansion team in the Arizona Diamondbacks. His deal with Arizona was for four years, that makes sense, and just $52.4 million. Now, I know this is a lot of money to the average person, but even if you adjust it for inflation two decades later, Johnson's contract with the Diamondbacks is now worth a little under $94 million, so about $24 million a year for one of the greatest pitchers of all time. You know who also made $24 million last year? Patrick Corbin did too, all right? So don't talk to me. Unsurprisingly, Johnson pitched above his value, winning four National League Cy Youngs in a row from age 35 to age 38. Oh, and he also won a World Series in 2001, a year where the Astros were once again swept out of the NLDS by the Braves. The Astros, after making this gutsy move to trade for Johnson in an effort to win the World Series, continued winning without him. They maintained the same core of hitters in Biggio and Bagwell, as well as the solid rotation around Johnson, consisting of Mike Hampton and Shane Reynolds. They won the NL Central 
title in 1999 and 2001, but lost the NLDS both times. But there's one more piece of this puzzle left to address. What about the Mariners? Well, in return for dealing their franchise ace, they acquired a great bit of talent in Freddy Garcia, Carlos Guillen, and John Halama. Garcia won over 75 games in five seasons with two all-star nods for Seattle, and though Guillen's best years would be with Detroit later on in his career, he was still a solid bat and dependable glove for the Mariners. Overall, Garcia was worth 18.6 war, Guillen was worth 9.1 war, and Halama was worth 5.4 war. That totals 33.1 wins above replacement for the Mariners, and just 4.3 wins above replacement for the Astros. So technically, from a numeric value, you could say that the Mariners won this trade in a landslide. But much like war, the value of these numbers goes beyond their final sum. The Astros truly went for it all in this move, a move that I respect. They knew the weight of what they were giving up and were willing to make that sacrifice to try and win their first World Series. The Mariners, already with a plethora of talent, might have been better off keeping Johnson and trying to pay him. In a way, both sides won and both sides lost in this deal. The only trades I could find that brought more war in a single second half after the trade were Carlos Beltran for those same Astros in 2004, CeCe Sabathia for the Brewers in 2008, which I already did a video on, and Ricky Henderson for the Oakland A's in 1989. But all in all, this trade is one of the most bizarre, forgotten stretches in baseball history. If you couldn't tell from the highlights, those National League hitters were overwhelmed by the big unit, and they probably could have used some help from WinReality, today's sponsor. WinReality is a VR baseball training application available that gives players access to unlimited game speed reps no matter where they are. You can even use your own bat. Their pitcher library consists of 600 plus pitchers from 8U to pro level. From the release to the spin to the speed, hitters get a chance to study every pitch, then hit it in the real game. WinReality gives players of all levels a variety of workouts that are focused on pitch recognition, timing, and decision making. It's used by a majority of MLB teams as well, including MVP winner in the National League, Paul Goldschmidt. Hitters love it, coaches rave about it, parents love what it's done for their players' enjoyment of baseball. Win reality isn't a game, it's a revolutionary tool that improves hitting in the real game of baseball in season, off season, and in any weather. Hitters can see increased confidence and improvement at the plate with this simple product. It allows players to train anywhere, anytime against game speed pitches their coaches and teammates can't replicate at practice. Train in here and improve your game out there. And you can do so today by heading to winreality.com slash jolly to sign up right now. The link is in my description, so definitely take advantage of this awesome product if you want to improve your swing. Thank you to WinReality for sponsoring today's video, and I'll see you guys next time.